Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, we welcome back a longtime supporter of the Natural Resource Investment Symposium and a personal friend of mine, Mr. Andy Sheckman from Miles Franklin. Andy, thank, thank you for your ongoing support of our conference and thank you for the care and attention that you've paid to our clients for decades. Uh, the honor is mine, Rick. Thanks uh, for having me here, and I uh, wouldn't miss it. It's the only, it's the only symposium or show that I, I X out, put on my calendar a year in advance. So glad to be here. Well, we appreciate the support. For the purposes of this interview, Andy, I think I'm going to skip the normal thing that you and I do uh, about gold and silver. Uh, it has uh, occurred to me that people who have come to this conference uh, come to this conference because they already understand the thesis around precious metals ownership. So rather than beating that horse, what I thought I'd really like to do is dig into your brain uh, and tell people about the mechanics of buying and selling and storing uh, bullion. Uh, I, I consider bullion myself, and I describe it to my clients, as foundational liquidity. Uh, as you know, I think liquidity is a very good thing. And one of my favorite personal forms of liquidity is, in fact, in bullion. And I want to talk about how to do it, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. And it's interesting, too, because you, you call it liquidity. I've always called it wealth. I guess they're the same thing, one and the same. So we're coming at it from a very similar perspective. Yeah, I, no, I get that. And I think uh, that, that segues very well into the first question. Uh, first of all, what to own? What are the relative advantages and disadvantages between owning gold versus owning silver? And if you care, versus owning platinum and palladium? Who are they suitable for? What are the attributes? What are the downsides in each class of precious metals ownership? Sure. So platinum and palladium, first and foremost, to me, are an investment. I look at gold and silver as wealth. Platinum and palladium lack the historical context that gold and silver do. Now, you know, you can talk about you can talk about reasons why platinum and palladium might be a good investment. And a lot of it has to do with where it's mined in Russia and and, and in uh, South Africa. But to me, first and foremost, I think I would not advise people to own platinum and palladium until they have a foundation in gold and silver. Uh, for me, Ultimately, the place to be ultimately is in gold. And in April of 2019, when the Bank of International Settlements reclassified gold as the only other tier one reserve asset next to U.S. dollars and treasuries, I think it, it, it sets the table for, for where gold ultimately ends up in the financial system. And, and so I think ultimately the place to be is gold. But you know, there's a very compelling argument for silver, Rick. We did, we had a record year last year and, and in over a half a billion dollars in sales, 97% of every transaction we did was silver. And I'm not joking, that is an accurate number, 97%. The, the, the demand for silver is incredible. The duality in applications or in demand, whether it be a growing green and digital footprint in silver versus a, a, um, a, a renaissance, if you will, in, in monetary uh, demand for silver creates a very unique uh, environment. The environment is a ratio between gold and silver price-wise right now at about 83 to 1, and that's historically out of whack. When you look at price anomalies, when you look at, 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 at distortions in historical prices, the difference between gold and silver right now um, at 83 to 1 is in rarefied air. You know, geologically, for, you know, for thousands of years, the ratio was 16 to 1. For the last few hundred years, it's averaged about 42 to 1. And I talked with Keith Newmeyer about that. I was at dinner with him a few weeks ago, and, and he said to me, look, globally, it's coming out of the ground at a seven to one global ratio. It's being mined at seven ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold, yet it's priced at 83 to one. And it's averaged 42 to one for the last hundred years and 16 to one for thousands of years before that. So look, the bottom line is simple. To me, silver is the value proposition in this industry of a generation. It is wildly undervalued. It has huge utility in industrial and monetary applications, and they're expanding. So I think silver is a pathway into getting a whole lot more gold. And I, I think 
ultimately the place to be is gold or it wouldn't have been reclassified tier one in 2019. The only other tier one assets being US dollars and treasuries. So it's going to have a role. And so when I say it's a pathway into getting more gold, one way to do that is to own silver at an 83 to one ratio. And as it regresses to its mean somewhere in the 40 to one, or maybe even towards its geologic mean right now of seven to one, you convert to gold. So I think preservation um, lies with gold. And I think opportunity is with silver. I like them both. I consider them both to be wealth, both to be money, but I think the real opportunity is in silver, but ultimately I'd like to see people in gold. Very clear uh, for either gold or silver or gold and silver. Can you discuss briefly the difference between buying and owning bullion rather than buying and owning bullion coins? Right. So, you know, it's funny because I, I, I basically look at them both the same way, um, whether it be bullion bars or ingots made by refineries or by sovereign governments like the Royal Canadian Mint or the Perth Mint um, or coins made by the Canadian government or the Canadian Mint. Really, the distinction. Do they have, do they have, do they have similar markups and similar liquidity? They always do did have similar markups and similar liquidity. And that's that's kind of what I'm getting at. The distinction right now is in what's going on with the premium on sovereign coins. I'm one of only 24 US mint authorized resellers in the world. And it, it, it's it's an honor we're very proud of. And, and I'm high up on the food chain with the US mint and all of the distributors. And so if I were to sell Silver Eagles right now at, um, 12 or $13 over the price of silver, I'm gonna be probably the lowest in the United States. The premiums on silver eagles have gone parabolic and it hasn't happened yet in gold items, but the same thing is true with the Canadian Maple Leaf, with the Philharmonic, all of the one ounce silver sovereign coins have reached levels that are two to three, sometimes four times what I've seen in my entire career. Now the bars have gone up a lot too, but not to the same degree the coins have. And it speaks to, I guess, you know, the, the, the inefficiency of the mints not being able to produce the, the, the quantity of coins that, that are demanded by the public. In the case of the U.S. Mint, they're not allowed to go into the open market and pay more than the average price of silver. And so they've been, have a hard, been having a hard time getting the planchets to make the one ounce coins. Bottom line is this, if I had my choice, I would own one ounce or sovereign mint coins. They do have benefits. The biggest benefit in owning the sovereign mint coins, other than the, the demand, I guess you could argue liquidity is pretty much the same, slightly better with the smaller utility uh, pieces like one ounce versus a hundred ounce bar. But the big reason uh, or the big advantage, I guess, is in uh, privacy. If you sell more than a thousand ounces in bar form or in generic round form, a 1099 is filed by the dealer. It is um, um, a 1099B miscellaneous income form is filed when those are sold back to the dealer. If the dealer were to take in uh, unlimited amount of American Eagles or Canadian Maple Leafs or Austrian Philharmonics, there is no 1099 issue. Doesn't mean taxes aren't due, but the bottom line is that in and of itself creates a, a, a big demand for the sovereign coins. Um, other than that, look, they have the same amount of gold or the same amount of silver in them. One is made by a government, one is made by a refinery, typically. But um, I have no problem with the bars. In fact, I have for the past, for the last six months, have been recommending that people buy kilo and 100 ounce silver bars and one ounce gold bars. Um, they carry the least markup. They are not too big to diminish liquidity, especially in the case of the kilo bar, 32.15 ounces, about the size of an iPhone. But it gives, I think you're paying too high of a premium in a historic context. I've been doing this for 33 years. I've never seen premiums as high as they are on coins ever. And that goes both way, by the way. I mean, I'm bidding north of eight or nine dollars over the price of silver for Silver Eagles. It goes both ways, but I've never seen them this high ever. And either it's a whole new reality or it's not. And I am favoring getting the biggest bang for the buck without being penny wise and pound foolish. I could tell people to buy a thousand ounce silver bar and they'd save money. But I think the loss of flexibility is not quite commensurate with the, 
the savings that you're getting. So 100 ounce kilo, 10 ounce in silver, one ounce gold bars and gold, that is gonna be the most conservative way to go. The dealers like myself make the least amount of money on them. And so it's the best value to the public bar none. And it's what we've been recommending pretty much exclusively now um, for the entire year, the last uh, five months. Can we talk a bit about storage and safekeeping, both from the, the point of view of uh, economical storage and safekeeping, from the point of view of the ability to buy uh, into and sell from uh, various forms of storage and safekeeping, and also particularly about security. You know, if you're buying gold to preserve your family's wealth <coughs> and the storage facility goes to facility heaven, uh, mm -hmm. that's problematic for you. So if you could address the whole, the whole topic briefly of storage, safekeeping, and security. Yeah, as far as storage facilities are concerned, we partnered 12 years ago with Brinks, and I, I, I have chosen Brinks for several reasons. They're a massive company, I think a Fortune 100 company, multinational. I, they do everything by the book, 100%. Um, and, and I've never even seen one ounce of gold or silver uh, misappropriated, ever. And, and, and then we employ third-party auditing. Um, when you choose a storage facility, I think paramount number one is that you don't want to store it in the same facility um, that, that the, the precious metals company um, is running their business out of. There needs to be a separation sort of church and state in this respect where um, you want to go with a, a company that has a balance sheet big enough to be able to withstand uh, a slowdown in, in the economy or whatnot. You want to go with a company that is known uh, for being uh, synonymous with security and safety. And that's why we chose Brinks and, and I'm very glad that we have. You wanna be able to uh, go to the facility and retrieve your product uh, if need be. And I think that's something you wanna know where it is being stored. There are companies out there that tell you they work with very reputable companies, but they won't tell you where it is. And I think that's a problem. We tell our clients, look, we have a relationship with the Brinks Vancouver, Brinks Montreal, Brinks Toronto, Miami, Los Angeles, um, Salt Lake City in New York. And if you want to go retrieve your metal, you can. You fill out a form, you go pick it up. Um, but I think the best place to store it is on your own person. You know, most people, Rick, aren't like you and I, who the public associates with gold. And, and so, you know, it, it's an issue of privacy, of safety. Um, when we send product to people, as an example, we send it in a, in a very nondescript box with supplemental insurance. In other words, if, if I send you a box of $50,000 worth of gold, I'm going to insure it for $500 through UPS and supplementally through Lloyd's of London for $49,500 with no identifying markings on the box. So no one knows that you just received a box $50,000 insured by the carrier to your door. Uh, and so we start from that standpoint of making sure that the metal that we send to you uh, doesn't uh, arouse any suspicion. And then, look, most people uh, aren't in the limelight talking about gold and silver all the time, so they don't need to worry about it. You hide it, you get a safe, or you bury it under a floorboard, or, or in the attic under some insulation. A paint can, you buy at Home Depot and splash paint on it and put it in the basement with your other paint cans or, or bury it in your backyard under a tree and become a midnight gardener. I think in general, if you can take possession of it and hold it, you're better off. You don't need to pay a company like mine storage fees. Um, the difference is that, you know, one, it's insured if it's with a storage company. You won't be able to get your metal insured even with a, a company like Chubb or a really high-end insurance company. They won't insure precious metals. You can't put them on a rider. And so, you know, the only downfall of holding it yourself is is the potential of, of theft or fire. But uh, quite frankly, I think you have a better chance of being ripped off by the system than you do a burglar if you're just a person investing uh, in, in precious metals. So definitely choose a company <laughs> like Brinks if you're going to store it third party, a big company that has a great track record. And if you're able to not lose any sleep at night and take a little time and, and get creative on storing it safely, that's the best way to do it. Keep it at home, have access to it when you need it. 
if somebody does take the storage option, <clears throat> uh, do you have a preference between uh, allocated, segregated, and unallocated? I would never, ever, ever choose unallocated. <clears throat> in fact, that was one of the prerequisites in our relationship with Brinks. Uh, and I wouldn't even ever choose allocated, ever. Um, and in, in, in including IRAs. And I don't work with uh, the deposit. I, I encourage my clients not to work with the depositories with IRAs that only allocate to the program. The key here is segregation. That is the distinction. You must be segregated. I can tell you horror stories that I've dealt with, in particular with IRAs, where the, the silver was allocated to the IRA program, but not segregated to Rick or not segregated to Andy. And when, you know, the key to the IRA, precious metals IRA, is the ability to take an in-kind distribution. So you say, hey, I'm nearing retirement. I'm old enough to take distributions out of my IRA. I want the metal sent to me that I bought in lieu of a cash distribution. It's called in-kind. And horror stories where I've seen, um, Clients buy premium items like uh, Royal Canadian Mint 100 ounce bars, 500 of them, and get back um, dinged up generic ishy bars that are worth hundreds of dollars less per bar and the IRA custodian won't do anything about it because they only allocated it to the program they did not segregate it. It's a really good point because the bottom line is simply this. If you choose a third party storage system, whether it be in an IRA or not, uh, you know, non-qualified funds, it must be segregated, not commingled and not just allocated to the program. You want allocation and segregation, not just allocation. And that's the key to physical storage so that there is no question that the metal that you bought or that you sent in is returned to you if and when you decide to do it. It's a really big deal and, and the delineation between a good experience and a really bad one, potentially, uh, with a third party storage company. That's very clear. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> finally, I want to talk about liquidity. Uh, you buy this stuff, you take delivery, we could talk about that. But more importantly, when you sell the stuff, what does somebody need to know uh, about selling it back to you or selling it in the market? Is there a difference, as an example, between gold or silver that you stored at home? that has somehow come, quote, out of system in terms of your ability to resell it without dealer fear that the material is counterfeit. Could you talk something about liquidity and how investors need to plan for liquidity? Yeah, so there, there really is no um, issue with liquidity with precious metals. In fact, I consider them to be the most liquid asset on the planet in the respect that there's no clearing time or settling time as there is with securities. I think it you can correct me if I'm wrong. It used to be T plus three. I think it's now T plus two, something along those lines. If you have metal in our storage facility, in one of our facilities, and you need to sell it, it'll happen instantaneously. More often than not, we'll be able to wire you on the outside at 48 hours. Usually if it's within you know that day that we get the, the signed statement back from you, we'll send the wire immediately. So there's, there's no liquidity issues whatsoever. Uh, if it's in a storage facility, if it's at home, no, I mean, it's very easy. We assist on sending it back. And in some cases, we'll, most cases, we'll send a UPS air bill to the client uh, by email. They'll, with instructions how to pack it up, we can either arrange UPS to pick up the material or you go to a UPS hub and send it back. Or we tell you how to do it safely by registered mail upon receipt. Uh, if there's any question whatsoever about authenticity, we have the sophisticated machinery that tells us down to a thousandth of a gram what the content of the uh, of um, the the coin or bar is. And so, look, I've been doing this a long time and and have seen anything counterfeit maybe two or three times in in seven billion dollars in transactions. So it's a it's a it's a very rare occurrence, but. But the bottom line is it's very, 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 very liquid. It's very private and we can help you send it back to us and guarantee the highest bid price in the country by not charging a buyback commission. But I think it's important to understand one thing. This is why it's important to buy what you were talking about, um, whether it be sovereign coins or generic bars and rounds or, or things that people uh, are used to seeing, not buying numismatics or rare pieces or something that is esoteric because 
gold and silver are homogenous. So whether you're at a dealer in Seattle, Washington, or Los Angeles, or in New York City, or in Salt Lake City, or in Minneapolis, or in Fort Lauderdale, or wherever you are, 99% of the value should be the same. There'll be variances in what the companies will pay you above spot or below spot or whatnot. But the bottom line is it's homogenous. And so you're not beholden to the company who you bought it from. And this is one of the reasons to buy things that are vanilla, that everybody wants. And, uh, and then you won't have that issue at all. And in terms of planning for liquidity, look, you don't want to call someone up when you know you need to sell $2 million uh, of gold to buy a home and you close uh, in 24 hours. You, you want to give a little bit of a lead time if you're sending things back or even in a depository. So they're very, very liquid items, incredibly so non-subjective at that but in terms of lead time for something very important you know three four five days heads up hey i need this without fail in my bank account by this next thursday or i'm in trouble great just don't call me wednesday afternoon and say that other than that uh, there is liquid and is easily uh, retrieved whether it be to take possession of or to sell out of a depository or from your home as as can be Andy, thank you very much for this educational session. I'm delighted to be able to feature you at our conference, as we have for so many decades. Any final word you might have or any final offers you might have for our attendees? So uh, final word is, well, first of all, Rick, thank you. I mean, it goes without saying how much I appreciate being here and our, our relationship. And um, I'm very happy for you and your new endeavor, and I'm excited to be part of it. As far as uh, what I can promise your attendees, you know, I, I remember once you, you told me that I was crazy to put my cell phone number on my business card a long time ago. And I stopped doing that a, a while back because my phone would blow up all hours of the night from all around the world. But I'm going to give my personal email uh, out, and that's Andy at milesfranklin.com. And if anyone comes from your show or hears this interview, I will guarantee them my personal service and the best price in the United States on, or in North America for your Canadian listeners um, on anything that they want. I will go out of my way to make it a very, very good experience. And, you know, one of the things that I take for granted uh, is, is reputation and track record. We've never had a customer complaint in 33 years, and, and yours certainly won't be the first. And I'll make darn sure of that by having them contact me personally. And any questions that they have, I'll answer them. Any, any um, items that they want to purchase, I'll make sure it's a good experience. Anything that they want to store, I'll help them do it. And uh, it, that's out of great appreciation for our friendship and, and uh, just you know, being associated with the best show in the business and looking forward to seeing you in a, in a, in a couple months here, down here, just about a mile away from my house. So I'll look forward to seeing you. Well, Andy, I look forward to that myself. Uh, and I want to thank you, first of all, for this wonderful educational session that we're presenting to this year's attendees. But thank you, too, for your support of the conference and your support of our clients, as I say, over decades. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Andy Sheckman from Miles Franklin. Please pay attention. Please visit him at his virtual booth or the physical booth if you come to the Natural Resources Investment Symposium. Thank you and goodbye.